to welcome to the podium Reverend Michael Rickard, who is, he's not on holidays. <laughs> he's very much here. <laughs> he will be on holidays after today, however. He is known to us as the wordsmith, the poet, the teacher, the educator, the dancer, the singer. <laughs> And he will bring us a message this morning of light and love and freedom and joy. Please help me welcome Reverend Michael. Thanks, Carol. Good morning, friends. My friend Carol lost, left out songwriter. It's right there in your program. <laughs> Thank you. A warm welcome to you worshiping at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living, on this beautiful, sunny Sunday morning. And welcome, too, to those listening to me via the World Wide Web. Jamaica is currently in the period we call Emancipendence, a conflation of Emancipation Day, last Friday, August 1, and Independence Day, which is next Wednesday, August 6. So we get between emancipation and independence, emancipendence. Both emancipation and independence are related to that very desirable state called freedom, which is why I have decided to talk on prisons. The actual title of the talk is Freedom is Fine, but there are benefits to boundaries. To help you get into the right mood, I'd like us to sing together this freedom song that I wrote specially for the talk. The lyrics are on an insert in your program. Valerie, and I suspect Leith as well, We'll play it together twice for us, and then we'll sing it twice so that everybody gets the, the tune and the words. The title, My Soul is Free. Let's hear it again. Now that we have got it, my soul is free. I am at peace. My soul is free. I found release. My soul is free. The joy of life now fills my mind. My soul is free. God's love is mine, my soul is free, I am at peace, my soul is free, I'm found release, my soul is free, the joy of life now fills my mind, my soul is free. God's love is mine. That was the first time I'm hearing it sung in public. You sounded good to me. Now, 
We all love freedom. But just in case you ever find yourself in prison, I'm not putting any goat mouth on you, you know, but just in case, don't be like Orville. Until quite recently, Orville was a guest, we call them guests, in the Tower Street Adult Correctional Center, downtown Kingston, commonly known as the General Penitentiary, or GP. Three weeks ago, he was transferred to Richmond Farm Prison, which, from what the prisoners say, is just a big farm. It has no walls and sounds like the best type of prison for Orville if he has to be in prison. He's a middle-class man and has a house in the USA where his family live and another house in Jamaica. He spoke to us because he was taking the course that Reverend John and I conduct at the GP. And he told us that he was so depressed when he first got to the GP that for about three weeks he just couldn't manage to leave his cell. He sat from morning until evening with his back to the prison yard, just looking at the sun moving across a small square of three or four blocks on his cell wall. It became like a sundial to him, and he could tell from the position of the sun's rays on the blocks when it was lunchtime and when it was 3.30 in the afternoon and lockdown time had come. Yes, GP inmates are on lockdown in their cells from 3.30 p.m. to about 7.30 the next morning. If you love nightlife, prison is obviously not for you. For those who don't plan to check it out, let me tell you some more about the place and the classes we teach. The GP is and looks like a maximum security facility. From the street, you see 30 foot high red brick walls topped by rolled barbed wire. There are two entrances, one a huge iron gate for big vehicles to pass through, and just beside it, a smaller iron door for pedestrians. The notice on the walls around the doors include one about the dress code for visitors. Female visitors can't wear revealing garments. For example, sleeveless blouses and shorts. And there's a line, and I quote, bust lines should not be exposed. Imagine not even that little pleasure for the men for the five minutes that they're allowed with visitors. That's right, five minutes a week. A warder lets you through the pedestrian's door into a narrow corridor with a grilled gate at the end. Then you go into a driveway for buses and trucks, the one I mentioned earlier, which is also the reception area. Behind the warder who takes your cell phone, logs your name in a large book, and gives you a visitor's card. Behind him, there is a search area for visitors to the prisoners. Their bags and food containers are searched, and the contents of any store-bought packages that could contain contraband items, like powdered milk and flour, are poured into clear plastic bags. The family and friends of the inmates talk to each other through a small meshed window for, as I said, five minutes each time. As we head for the prison yard, Reverend John and I go down the driveway past two or three warders with long automatic rifles, then through two other gates and two more doors. That prison is really a prison. In the yard, you will see the inmates walking about in their white, no, make that off-white, T-shirts, and usually short khaki pants. Our escort, always a warder named Mr. Dixon, very pleasant young man, 
takes us to a computer room with about 30 computers and as many student inmates. Adjoining the computer room are the music room, and the prison band is continually playing music there. And right also beside it is the inmates' radio broadcast rooms. They do have a radio station. The prison also boasts a gym and a sports field. So you can see it's not all bad. Often, as we enter the chapel for our class, through yet another iron door, we see a class just ending. One member, a youth of about 17 or 18, told me one day that the class was in math, English, and civics. He proudly showed me his pile of textbooks. I asked if he had done those subjects on the outside, and he said yes, but he hadn't paid any attention. Now he seemed happy to. Unlike Orville, whom I mentioned earlier, he was benefiting from confinement. The approximately 1,600 inmates, more than the prison was built to hold, by the way, are housed in small cells with usually three to a cell. In some cells, the men sleep in three hammocks, hanging one on above the other. Once you get into your hammock in the evening, you stay there at 3.30. If you need to relieve yourself at midnight, you do so in a bottle. And don't you dare let any of the liquid fall onto the man below. There would be a fight, so we were told. Outside the chapel is a fenced off compound where special prisoners are kept isolated from the general population. The men in that section, who make up about 10% of the entire prison population, are allegedly homosexual. But I see no difference between their actions or dress. Uh, by dress, I mean their attire. They don't wear dresses. <laughs> and the rest of the populations. I see no difference. One difference that there is, though, is that many of them love gardening and they boast the only garden in the prison. A quarter of the compound is a well-kept garden with scallion, callaloo, and other quick crops, and a mango tree. The theme of the course that Reverend John and I teach as part of the church's outreach program, oh, by the way, the whole program was organized by Junior, who is, who is sitting at the back there. Hi, Junior. <laughs> The theme of the program is change your thinking, change your life. It expresses the essence of our teaching, which is the science of mind for you newcomers, the science of mind. A full class comprises 12 to 14 men, and the course runs for 12 weeks, after which we have a graduation. The course is based on three fundamental principles of science of mind. And for those who are hearing about science of mind for the first time, perhaps the visitors, not sure, please take note. These principles are our teaching in a nutshell. Principle one, there exists an unsleeping universal energy within and around you which you automatically use when you think. Because that energy is creative, you create something every time you think. As Dr. Ernest Holmes, founder of religious science, founder of our teaching, puts it, all thoughts is creative. You are part of a creative mind. Principle two. Your habitual way of thinking about yourself and the world, whether positively or negatively, causes the universal energy to be strongly activated in a corresponding way. And it co-creates with you the events and the conditions of your life. You create directly 
through your words and actions, while the universal power creates indirectly through what we call race consciousness. Principle three, with diligent effort, you can change your habitual way of thinking, which determines your life, and this change will lead to a corresponding change in your life. Those are the three principles. The principles of the course that we taught, teach, the principles of science of mind. It's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, and I'd like now to summarize that summary in one sentence. Here it is. Because of the operation of an impersonal, universal creative mind, of which your mind is a part, if you generally think positively, you will have a successful life, and vice versa. That is not a promise. That is a law, a law of nature, like the laws of gravity, the laws of light, the laws of heat. Of course, if I told that to a newcomer, he or she would have all sorts of questions. And newcomers, if you do have questions, please ask Carol and myself in the vestibule after. Even if, even if you're not a newcomer and want questions, come and ask us. It's natural to have questions after hearing this revolutionary sort of teaching. And that is why we have classes. Come to classes. Or you can take classes on the internet, on sense of mind, and you will get all the answers. I just said that universal mind works through race consciousness, which is generally defined as the collective consciousness of the human race. But I think that it should include the minds of animals as well. Here are some quick examples of universal mind co-creating with my mind. These are personal examples. On Friday, a couple of days ago, I said to Elaine, my wife, I wonder if it will rain today. And immediately I walked out on the patio to look at the sky. Hovering in the air a few feet off the patio was a bunch of rain flies. I got my answer. Yes, it did rain that day, many hours later. Another morning, a few years ago, I said to her, I wonder what time it is. And as I spoke, I turned on the radio to get the time. As it came on, I heard, the RJR time is now, so and so and so. It was about 7 o'clock. As I turned it on, how did they know that I was going to turn on to get Universal mind. While writing an article some time ago, I got stuck for the word referring to the room in a church beside the altar area and said to myself, I bet Reverend John knows. So I'm there pondering whether I should phone him or email him. And the phone rings. Who is it? Reverend John. He's calling about some unrelated matter, of course. He didn't know what I was. But he knew I wanted something. So I asked him the question, and he told me the answer, vestry. Once, while standing beside the phone about to call Elaine, it rang. Yes, it was Elaine. And I was walking the, on the crowded streets of New York with my children one afternoon, looking for a certain theater. I asked a passerby, he didn't know, but someone else just passing us said, follow me, I'm going that way. I could, of course, go on and on and on with these examples. And every single one of you has several similar stories, probably everyone in the world. Now, if these unrelated things apparently unrelated, happened once in a while. We might call them coincidences, meaning unrelated events. But since they apparently happen every minute of every day to everybody, there has to be 
some invisible energy connecting each of us with other people and other things like the rain flies. That connection was noticed thousands of years ago. It has been going on. And because we are a naming race, we gave the name, we, the, we gave the connecting energy a name. In English, that name is God. And because we are an imaginative race, we have imagined up all sorts of attributes for God, some of which have helped us, while some have harmed us. But that's for another talk. You'll be glad to hear that the inmates respond positively to our teaching. So it's no surprise that since we started classing, classes in November, about four of our students have left the prison as they wanted to. Another two will be leaving by Christmas. You might very reasonably ask why all the students haven't left, for surely all of them want to get out. <coughs> Don't be too sure. Many of them, this is one of the surprises to me, many of them say that they are happy in prison. And besides, they are learning things that they had not known before, things that they will need to learn if they are to make it on the outside. Freedom is fine, but there are benefits to being in prison. Now, on to the students. I said I'd tell you a bit about the students. Two weeks ago, Norris, a member of our first class in November, came up to us with a particularly big smile on his face. He's usually smiling. And he has a pleasant personality. You'd like him. But he was extra happy as he told us that he was leaving prison that Friday, three days' time. He had been paroled after serving about 14 to 17 years of his original life sentence. Norris is a very classy dresser, even in prison. No ordinary t-shirt and shorts for him. Nice shoes or sneakers clothes that are not only clean but stylish and he always has a pair of dark glasses perched on his head. He has often commented on Reverend John's and my clothes, especially mine, <laughs> whether, whether, whether they matched or not. He hasn't seen me in the suit. Being, being very intelligent, he understood the psychological and spiritual concepts that we taught very quickly. In his hand, as he was speaking to us that day, was a bottle of a brownish liquid, roots tonic. He was strengthening himself, he told us, for his meeting with his wife on Friday. I asked if he would also be going to the nearest bar to have a drink. I do not drink or smoke, he tells me. He doesn't sound like a GP inmate, does he? Neither does Derek. Derek is an ed educated middle class man with a radio announcer's voice, something like that. He's very polished in manner and dress. Very religious. And he too got a really long sentence. I haven't asked him what it was. You'd think he'd be unhappy in prison, the way that Orville was. Far from it. He's always smiling and says repeatedly that going to prison has been good for him. There he found God and love. Here's a direct quote from Derek. What was taught to me on the outside was not love. I learned it here. I'm living a new life. I wasn't aware of the good inside me until I came here." Unquote. Then there's Moses, whose six foot two frame exudes a really peaceful consciousness. He was put in a cell with men who have the same calm disposition, and he was happy about that, of course. 
But he didn't realize until Reverend John and I explained that the spiritual law of attraction caused the authorities to put him there with men of a similar disposition. He was in prison. He is in prison for drug trafficking. He told us that when he was at the airport on the fateful day, about to board the play, plane with the drugs, something inside him said, do not go on that plane. But he said, I couldn't resist. That's a quote. And he went on, and he got caught. Then there's Robert, who learned about computers when he went to prison. And he caught on so quickly that for the last several months, he was a computer lecturer and very well respected by the other men. As of last weekend, he was also a free man, man one of the men who are out now. Jeffrey, another man, he's a middle-class university graduate. You know, the major difference that I see between that GPT, GP class and the many other classes that I've been teaching for 30 odd years is that the inmates are more religious. That's the difference. Moses, for example, said that as long as he's in his cell, he has his Bible open. His favorite occupation is going to church. And every Sunday, there is church in the chapel. About four or five denominations take turns over the month um, conducting the service. So prison has been good for just about every member of the, our classes. I can't think of one who has said it has been bad, but I'm just saying, just in case, just about every member. At least two said, learned there in prison that they have an aptitude for music. Many said the first time that the, for the first time in prison, they have had time to really think about life. So you see the benefits of that long lockdown time. Just about all have said that they learned to look at life in prison in a different way from outside. <coughs> By now, you may be asking how the lives of these prisoners concern you. The crux of the talk is that we are all confined in some way or the other. And just as the inmates benefit from their constraints, I want you to see the benefits of your constraints, whatever they are. I want you to look for the silver lining. I want you to take the lemon and make lemonade. I want you to use the obstacles as stepping stones. When you're at the end of the rope, I want you to tie a knot in the end so that you can hang on. Some of us have physical limitations. In fact, we all have physical limitations, for we are human beings. But there are some who are more severely limited than the average person. But what has Felix Kleiser done about it? He was born with no arms, so he uses his feet for most things. This includes eating, dressing, writing, and being a professional French horn player. He has toured with Sting. He's working on his second album. And he has a diary which is full of concert bookings right up to December 2015. That 23-year-old German became an ambassador recently for the One-Handed Musical Instrument Trust which helps fund the development of adapted or specially designed instruments for musicians with one hand or other limb deficiencies. That story came from, in an email from my friend Jackie Guy in London on Wednesday, just when I needed it. Again, connection. Some of us have low self-esteem perhaps because our body structure is not exactly like such and such movie star or model, or perhaps an acquaintance or a classmate. Like 15-year-old Francesca Tavares, a bubbly Christian-minded Woolmers School student. Bubbly, yes, but according to a recent Observer story, she had a deep, dark secret. 
She was depressed for most of her high school life because other students teased her for being short and chubby. She grew increasingly suicidal and one day tried to take her own life by drinking a bottle of what she thought was bleach. Fortunately, it wasn't and she didn't die. After counseling, she gained sufficient self-esteem to start studying hard and went on to do exceptionally well in her CXC exams. Eight distinctions. She must have been among the top two or three CSEC students in her school that year, and she would have beat out, I'm sure, all those who were teasing her. Jesus believed in persistence too, hanging on, trying one more time. A number of his parables teach that virtue. The persistent widow, for example, wanted suicide from a very feisty, meaning disdainful judge. Luke 18 tells us that the widow kept going again and again and again to the judge, and he kept refusing and refusing until at last he rel relented because of her persistence. And then Luke 11 tells us about the persistent friend who knocks on his friend's door at midnight asking for three loaves of bread to feed another friend who is just visiting. And in Jesus' own life, there are two stories of his disciples fishing all night and catching nothing, and then Jesus telling them to try one more time. When they do, you know the story, they catch so much fish that they are overwhelmed. Fills up the boat, etc. Jesus' message in those and other stories is never give up on your goal. Why? Because he says, in essence, God helps those who help themselves. <coughs> but in New Thought, we explain it a little bit more elaborately. We teach that when you set your intention to do something, the energy of the universe coalesces around you to help you to fulfill that intention. And I just gave some examples of my setting intention. What time is it? The rain, etc and the universe giving me answers. So think big. Set yourself a worthwhile goal. In Lauren Suku's immortal words, from this podium just recently, choose the biggest, baddest mango tree to climb. And don't stop till you reach the mango. In Les Brown's immortal words, it is not over until you win, unquote. One last thing. Remember that though, because we are human, we'll always have certain physical limitations. Because we are also spirits, we ultimately live in a field of infinite possibilities. We always have choices of action, which in the short or long term can free us from any particular situation. Not all of them, of course, but one by one as we choose. Now, let's close off with my freedom song again. You did it so beautifully. Valerie, please remind us of the tune. Then we'll sing. <clears throat> Happy independence, everyone. Namaste.